appreciate the young people, our young adults singing. Uh, I believe they're going to sing again tonight because I believe we're losing one of them. Helen, you're going back to Columbus, aren't you, this week? So, of course, we won't see her for a while. She goes back up to Ohio State and they get ready to start their school year. But they're going to sing again tonight for us. And so uh, we appreciate them and uh, their blessing. I believe that there's the power of God in the gospel. Yes. If people can hear that God loves them, that he sent his son for them, that his son lived a sinless life, went to the cross, and took their sin there, paid its penalty, and was buried and rose again. I believe if people can hear that, that they can be saved. Any man, woman, boy, or girl yes. can hear the gospel and be saved. But we have to preach the gospel right. to the lost. We have to bring the lost to hear the gospel, don't we? That's where, that's where that falls on us. We've got to get lost souls under the sound of the gospel. We have to get men and women, boys and girls, and families and friends who do not know the Lord, we have to get them here where they can hear the word of God. We've got to get the gospel to them through a gospel track, and, uh, and then God will do his work. But, uh, but that's where we are. It's just one more. Uh, one more. So uh, you pray about that. We're thankful for it. But I want to preach this morning on this subject, the value of a soul. The value of a soul. The Lord laid a, this thought on my heart a few weeks ago. It was some portions of the Bible that I want you to look at with me. I want you to open your Bible to two places. Mark chapter 8. And uh, Luke chapter 15, we're going to go to Mark chapter 8 first. The value of a soul. What's a soul worth? You know the devil doesn't value a soul, a life. He is willing to throw it away, to have it be wasted, for it to die without ever knowing its value. What's the value of a soul? Mark chapter 8. I'm going to start reading verse 34. And I'm going to read down to verse 38. And then we'll look in Luke chapter 15 also. Mark chapter 8. The Lord is teaching, speaking here. 
Verse 34, when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. Now, that's not a riddle, even though it sounds a little funny. But what the Lord is trying to teach believers like you and I, if you're here today and you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, is you got a choice to make. <clears throat> what will you do with your life? Are you going to hold on to it? And are you going to make your decisions? Are you going to fulfill your desires? Are you going to make your own plans about what you think is best and follow through on them? Are you going to keep control of your life? Or are you going to give that to the Lord? That's the choice we make. If we choose to keep it, we'll lose the potential impact that our lives could make in this world in eternity if we would have given them to the Lord. Does that make sense? If we want to hold on to and live selfish lives, we're going to lose the potential that is in the Lord, that he would take our lives and use them to glorify his name and impact eternity. If we choose to let him have control, some people would say, you're losing your life. You're throwing it away. You're giving it away. No, I'm investing it. And the Lord takes it, and he does more with it that's going to matter in eternity than I ever could have. I might lose, as the world views it, losing, losing that control, losing those plans, those uh, things that might have pleased me, but I'm going to gain what God will do with my life, and that's what's going to glorify Him and make a difference. That's what the Lord's saying to the disciples here. You have a choice to make. For whosoever shall save his life, you're going to lose it. If you hold on to it, if you want to use it selfishly, you're going to lose how God could have used it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, you, get it, you, you put it in the Lord's hands and for the sake of the gospel, and you're going to save it from being wasted. You'll save it from being wasted. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own <clears throat> soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. I want you to, I want you to consider today the value of a soul. The value of a soul. Lord, bless the reading of your word today. Empower it by the Holy Spirit. We believe your presence is with us. Lord, if we're born again believers, you're in us. And Lord, we thank you for your word. God, these words that we've read and that we will look at, God, they came from your heart. They came from your mind. They expressed to us your will and your pleasure. And so, God, may we respond to you, to your word, <clears throat> in the way that pleases you. Lord, speak to us about the value of a soul, ours, others, Lord, there's people, people all around us and in our families that need to know these truths. And so, Lord, if, if there are folks here, God, that could profit from this truth, Lord, then it's up to us to help share it with them. Take these truths and share them with others. And so, Lord, bless your word today. We're praying someone that maybe is lost today or uncertain about salvation or maybe someone Lord who feels that just trying to do right and come to church and or just uh, try to, uh, to to do those things that uh, that or they feel like are enough God may someone come to the end of that and realize that they must be born again and Lord may we as believers today that know you as our personal savior may we not lose sight of the value, God, of our souls and the souls of others. 
in, uh, in their relationship to you. And so we commit these things to you. We do pray for our nation, for our church, for our families. Lord, we pray you would just hedge our families in and Lord, help them to return back into church and God, Lord, uh, into a place where they can be encouraged and strengthened by your word. And Lord, a place where they can serve you and invest God to make a difference, to help in this moment we're in. And so uh, these things we ask in your name today. We ask them in Jesus' name we pray. And amen. Amen. Now, you know, there is a cost to our salvation. There is a cost to our salvation. And I think you'll understand my approach to that. You know, we often hear the expression, nothing in life is free, don't we? <laughs> nothing in life is free. The Bible tells us the salvation of our eternal soul is a gift. It's a gift, the gift of God. Ephesians 2.8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I believe this. I believe what the Bible says, that there is nothing that I can do, there's nothing I can do that would earn salvation. There's nothing I could do that would merit God's forgiveness of me in and of myself. There is nothing, nothing at all, no work I could do that would be adequate to obtain salvation in myself. No way, nothing I could give that would be equal to the price. No, no way I could pay for the forgiveness of my sin and my salvation. I, 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 the, I believe that. There's nothing, nothing. Salvation is a gift of God. It's given by His grace. By grace are you saved. By grace, because God gives what we cannot earn, what we do not deserve. God gives that. He gives that. It's a gift. Given by grace. It's experienced by faith. Faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Faith in His finished work. I also believe that my sin, though, has a debt that had to be paid. There's a payment that must be made for my sin and yours for the sin of every man. Romans 6.23 said the wages of sin is death. That's the payment, isn't it? Death. The death that's described here is beyond physical death. It's spiritual death. Spiritual death. That means a man lays down his life in this world physically, draws his last physical breath, but then his soul, which is eternal, enters eternity. And as a lost man, he enters hell where he will die forever and never, ever get dead. He's just going to keep on dying because his sin debt is so great. Even spiritual dying, a man can't ever get the debt paid, even though he's going to die every moment of eternity. I was born in this world a sinner. I owed a debt, my sin. My sin debt was already outstanding when I was born into the world. Owing to God a debt for my sin that I could not pay. I could not. I could not pay. I was helpless. I was hopeless. Never was ever there going to be any way I could escape that debt or eternal torment in hell. But God has made a way for me to be saved. He's made a way for all men to be saved. He's made a way for every man, any man, to be saved from, from spiritual death and hell. God makes salvation a gift. He willingly gives salvation. He willingly gives it. He gives it to any man who will receive it. But we know that in our own lives, a gift is that's given, a gift that's given had to be purchased. It, it had to have been made available through some effort, some expense, some work, some labor. I don't know about you, but 
when I was a kid, you don't judge me, I watched Bewitched. How many of you watched Bewitched on television? You know? She could twinkle her nose and clean the house and all that kind of thing, you know? And that was a fun show as a kid. But I don't know of any of you who can make something out of nothing. You have to buy it, you have to get it, you have to build it, you have to make it. There's gotta be work, there's gotta be labor, there's gotta be expense. We like to say that the best gifts are those that, you know, come from the heart. Your child may have made you something out of a tissue paper box or a paper towel tube, you know, gave it to you. But there was still an expense, there was still an effort, there was still a labor. That gift you received was free to you, but someone paid for it, didn't they? Someone paid for it. Who paid for it? The price for the gift of salvation. Was it you? Was it me? Was it man? Was it? We didn't pay that price. It was God who paid that price. Right. God paid the price. Yeah. God paid the price so that our sin might be paid in full. That our soul might be saved from eternal death and hell. What is the value of a soul? One soul, what's its value? What are you worth to God? That's the question I want you to ask. That's what I want you to think about today. What are you worth to God? You know, it's my prayer that every one of us will know and realize today what we're worth to God. You parents that have children, little children, there's several in the nursery today. By the way, I'll tell on myself before she tells on me hit one of your daughters in the head with the door. <laughs> she said, it's okay, Pastor. I didn't hit her very hard, but that door, they opened up and down. I didn't see her back there, and I coughed, coughed her. She said, it's okay, Pastor. I want to show you my new mask. She said, that's okay. They're precious. And you know what the world and the devil and the flesh want to do? They want to tell them they're worth nothing. They're worth nothing. Just throw it away, your life. You parents need to begin now to teach your children what they mean to God. What they mean to God. Because that's their anchor. That's what's going to get them through life is if they can understand what they mean to God, how does God value them? How does God see them? What are they worth to Him? Because, because that will help them. That will get them through some difficult, discouraging, trying times that they're going to have to face. They're going to go through those times. It's my prayer that each of us will understand what a soul is worth and that the worth of our souls any soul is not determined by other men i hope you know and i hope all the, our young people know that your worth and value as a person isn't determined by men it's not determined on how they treat you how they speak to you how they talk to you how they show you value or importance. It's not based on that. It's not based on that. It's not determined by the circumstances and situations and experiences of life. Don't, don't think that just because you're going through a difficult time that, that God is saying to you that your life doesn't matter. You don't have value to Him. Don't let the experiences you're going through determine value of worth of your life. It's my prayer that each of us and those we love will never look again to people, they'll never look again to the world for their self-worth and value, but look to God alone and see and understand what you are worth to Him. That's what we have to do. What He was willing to give for you, what He was willing to invest so that you might be saved. What great expense God was willing to pay.
for your soul. That's where we find our worth. That's where we find our value. I want you to turn now over to Luke 15, and I want you to look at this passage of Scripture with me. It's one of a set of parables we find in this chapter, and they all have to do with the value of souls. That's what this whole chapter is all about. Luke chapter 15, and I'm going to begin to read verse 1 and just read a little way down through the chapter, and you follow along with me if you will. Luke 15, beginning in verse 1, the Bible said, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you having a hundred sheep if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Now, I want you to notice in verse number one, it's interesting, isn't it, that there was always murmuring centered around the Lord Jesus. Always. You know, the Bible said, beware the man all men speak well of, because he's, he's, he's snowing everybody, isn't he? He's a snow job. You can't be real in the Lord and not cross somebody up, because... We're not all, all what we ought to be, are we? And the Lord, uh, God's used holy men, men trying to be right with God, boy, to really step on my toes sometimes, punch my buttons, because it was my fingers on the buttons. And, uh, and so the Lord had people murmuring about him all the time. One of the things they murmured about a lot here was, <clears throat> the company that he was willing to have around his presence. He didn't go out uh, into situations and circumstances that would be offensive to the Lord, to God, but he, he looked for opportunities to minister to people who had need, and they murmured about that. The Lord Jesus never fit the ideal of who God is or should be. That's the reason the Jews rejected him. He didn't fit their ideal, who they had pictured in their mind that their Messiah was going to be. He never did what the Pharisees and the religious people thought they ought to do. And he didn't, he didn't not do what they thought he ought not to do. And they murmured about him. You know, this week I thought about this. We have to be so careful that we do not make an idol in our heart and mind about who God ought to be. We can be guilty of that. We can have some idea about who we think God is. I, I, I'm reading through the Bible. I try to read through it always. I'm always reading through the Bible. And in the Old Testament, in one of the study Bibles I'm using right now, I've got marked over and over again with a, a line and a little reminder to me that when I read that, that normally doesn't fit my idea of who God is. But that's God. And he is just and righteous and holy in every action that he takes. Every decision that he makes, whether it fits and plugs into my formula about who God is or not. And we can't forget that. We, we make out the Lord Jesus to be the person we think he ought to be. Uh, and it's careful that we don't try to make him fit some idea of our hearts and minds. Sometimes we might refuse to see him as he is if who he is conflicts with some emotion that we have. Or if it conflicts with some, something that convicts us. We like to dismiss that about him. And feel like that can't be true. It can't be true. They murmured because the Lord Jesus could be seen with tax collectors. They hated them. Pagans. Samaritans. They, they murmured because of these things. And there's no doubt about it. The Lord Jesus came to the lost. He came into the world to sinners. 
He came to the hopeless. He came to the helpless. He came to the rejected. It says in just a few chapters over in Luke 19, verse 10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. It couldn't be more clear than that, could it? That's why he came. To seek and to save the lost. In verse number 3 of our text, the Bible said, and he spake this parable, Luke 15, he spake this parable unto them, saying, now, the Lord shared a series of stories with them, parables, and each of these was about the value of a soul, every soul, a single soul. I want you to see it. Notice, number one, the priority of every soul. Verse four said, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? I want you to see the priority of a soul. And remember, he's looking for a singular sheep, isn't he? Just one. Just one. The focus of the Lord here, the emphasis is on the effort that must be made to reach the lost. And Isaiah 53, verse 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to our own way. We are that lost sheep. We are that sheep. And I want you to see that the Lord puts the priority here. He puts the focus on going after and finding that sheep, that one lost sheep. The Lord Jesus left heaven. He left heaven. He came into the world for the singular purpose of finding a soul, a lost soul, my soul, your soul. In Luke chapter 14, he had spoken to the multitudes who followed him. In Luke 14, he said in verse 26, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now that statement doesn't fit the idea of a lot of people about the Jesus they know. He wouldn't say that. He wouldn't make a statement like that. He said if you don't if you don't love me more than your mother, your father, your brother, and your sisters, if you don't love me more than them, you're going to find out that you're never really going to follow me. You're going to always let them dictate how close in your relationship you are to me. This is what he said. He said in verse 27, And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple." Bear his cross. He's not talking about you dragging along, along the cross the Lord Jesus died on. The Lord Jesus' cross was the cross where he died to pay my sin debt. That's his cross. I don't have to drag his cross along. I'm not trying to pay my sin debt by doing the best I can do, working my way through life. No, that was done on his cross, on the cross, on the cross of Christ. He paid my sin debt in full. I have a cross, though, the Lord says, that I've, got to, that I've got to use. And my cross is for me a place to die, to self, to me. And I've got to use that cross every day. Whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and count the cost whether he have sufficient to finish it? lest haply after he have laid the foundation is not able to finish it, all that behold it began to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consult us whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassador and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you, that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. The Lord is talking about the priority of a soul and of the cost and the value of seeking them. He says, if you want to follow me, and if I follow the Lord very long in my life, you know where he's going to lead me? to having a heart to reach the lost. Because that's where he is. That's why he came. 
That's what he did. He came to seek and to save the lost. You can't walk with the Lord and be near the Lord where your heart is not also touched with and compassion for the lost. And that's going to cost me something. But there's a priority put on it here. I'm thankful for the committed to reaching the lost. Committed. I'm thankful for those who are truly following the Lord. I, I thank the Lord for all these missionaries, nearly 50 of them we have that we support them every month. Every month we send them at least $50 a month. That's not a lot. But it's something we can do to try to help them. I'm thankful for them. You know what they did? They were willing to love the Lord more than mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and houses and lands. They were willing to forsake all and follow Him. I'm thankful for them. I'm thankful. You know, it's not a normal time right now, but I'm thankful for bus workers. Under normal circumstances, we have bus visitation once a week. We go out and knock on doors, invite boys and girls, men and women to come to church and Sunday school and our buses and vans. And I'm thankful that we do that. I was thankful I was able to work at a church in Tennessee as the bus pastor. We had about six buses. We brought in over 200 people every Sunday on the buses. That's just the people who rode a bus to church. I'm thankful for the bus workers I had. They were committed. And you know what made the difference? It wasn't one hour a week out knocking on a door. It was every single day they prayed for, lived for, worked toward making a difference in the life of that child or that family. It wasn't just a couple hours on the weekend. They were committed. And God gave an increase. I'm thankful. I'm thankful for Sunday school teachers. Committed. Committed. And, and they're not teachers just an hour on Sunday morning. They, they view those students as their pupils all week long, every day of the week. They're praying for them. They're checking up on them. They're seeing what they need. They're celebrating birthdays. They're uh, doing all they can to make a difference in their life. They're committed. I'm thankful. Thankful to committed, committed businessmen and women who are faithful church members and tithe scripturally so the work of God can go forward. I'm thankful for uh, neighbors who are committed to reaching their, uh, their, their neighbors, housewives, their friends, mothers who are committed to trying to reach the families of their children's friends. Committed people, people who use gospel tracts. Someone was willing and committed to reach you with the gospel. Someone. Someone saw the value of your soul. And they wouldn't give up. And they were committed to reaching you. Committed to staying at it until you came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope you'll see from this passage of Scripture the priority of every soul. The priority of it. He left and came and sought out just the one. I was that one. You were that one. But write down number two, the persistency in finding one soul. He stayed at it in this parable until he found it. He stayed at it. It was the purpose of the Lord Jesus. It's what he came to do. It's why he endured what he did. Why he gave what he gave to reach that one soul. And he would not be turned back. Verse number four said, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost? Don't stop there. Underline the next phrase. What's it say? Until he find it. You gotta circle that word until, because that means there isn't any place to quit, is there? No place to give up. Until he find it. You and I, when it comes to the priority of reaching a lost soul, will either find a way to reach them, or we will find an excuse about why we stop trying to reach them, or why we will not try to reach them. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. It says in verse 4, He that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. He's saying, he's saying here that, that we can be 
very easily set aside from sowing the seed. You might have somebody who, who makes fun of you for passing out a gospel tract or takes it, throws it away, says something, says something unkind to you. You know what? That might have been enough. You've never done it again since then. You might have tried to knock on a door and invite someone to church or Sunday school and they might have mocked or made fun of you or said something to you. I've had every four-letter adjective in the book used uh, uh, just by simply inviting someone to church. And that might have been enough. You said, that's enough. I'm not going to do that anymore. He that regardeth the wind will not sow. And he that looketh at the stormy clouds well, I just believe I'm not going to get the tractor out of the barn today. It might rain. It might rain. We're either finding a way to get it done or we're finding an excuse. One or the other. Here, verse number 6, And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep which is lost. And here the man invites his friends to rejoice with him. A soul has been found and saved, rescued from sin and eternal suffering and hell and death. You know, we get so excited about so many simple things. Meaningless things. I'm talking about me, myself. Some sporting event. And we can't wait to talk about it. I'm tired of talking about it. All these sports, you know, that we that some are going to play, they're not going to play. I mean, it's like, who cares? They do or not. A million years from now, it's not going to matter that Ohio State didn't play Michigan in 2020. It's not going to make any difference. It's not going to matter if they play in baseball or football or whatever else they do or not do not do. But we get so excited about these things, and all we want to talk about, all we want to watch, and digest uh, into our hearts and our minds and we get excited now listen uh, all you women are, are are feeling okay but you get so excited about some sale that somebody's having you know? I'm going to save all this money you know a wise preacher told the church one day you save money at the bank not on sale that's how you save money you put that in the bank that's, that's a real savings, isn't it? We get so excited. Some sale, some deal that we get on some material thing. You know, the Bible says in Psalm 126, verse 5, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. I want to be able to rejoice about a soul that's found, a soul that's reached, a soul that's won to Jesus Christ. Just one soul. If just one soul. I want to be able to rejoice about that. Verse number 10 in our text, Likewise I say to you, there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Heaven rejoices over one soul. You, you, know, you know what heaven did about, about your favorite sporting team winning that big game? You know what they did? Listen, silence. That sale where you saved all that money? Silence. One little boy or girl that rides a bus for church, gets saved in a children's church or Bible club on Wednesday night, it's a little boy. All oh, heaven rejoices. They rejoice. Yeah. All heaven rejoices. I want to get excited about what excites the Lord. I want to rejoice about what heaven rejoices about. The priority of one soul. The Lord Jesus left heaven, came out of glory, came into this world, he walked the path that took him to the cross where he knew he was going to die. And he did it for one soul. Just one. The persistency we got to have. We're so easily turned aside. So easily turned away. 
in trying to reach the lost. Pastor, I wish we'd see more people saved at church, and I wish we would too. I wish we'd see Sunday mornings with people getting saved and people hearing the gospel and trusting Christ. We have, haven't we? We've seen it. It seems like sometimes it kind of goes in spurts, doesn't it? But you know what has to happen for the preacher to preach and souls to get saved? Somebody's got to get them in the door, Lord. How easily we're turned away from that and forget about that as a priority. Praise. Heaven rejoices over one soul saved. Now, now what is one soul worth to God? What, what are you worth to Him? What is your soul worth to God, your life? We know that salvation is a free gift. But we know that God paid for that gift, don't we? So, so if the gift a forgiveness of sin and eternal life, if that's a gift, then and, the, and God thought us worthy of giving us that gift, then we have to go back and see what price was paid. And that's simple, isn't it? John 3.16 said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. You know what you're worth to God? You're worth the suffering, the crucifixion, and death of his only begotten perfect son. That's what you're worth. The world can't give you value. People aren't going to give you real value of your life and worth. You need to look to what God gave for you. What he was willing to give for you. He was willing to give his only son for you. That, uh, that uh, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Hebrews 10 uh, chapter 2 and verse 9. Hebrews 2 9. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. This is what you mean to God. This is the value of a soul. He was willing that his son taste death so that they might have life. Even one soul. Even one soul. Isaiah 53, verse 10. It pleased the Lord, the Lord God, to bruise him, him being the Lord Jesus. It pleased God. When he looked down from heaven and saw his son nailed, bleeding to that, on that cross with that crown of thorns thrust upon his brow, stripped naked in shame, hanging on that cross, it pleased God. His son was doing that to become sin for us and paid sin's penalty. It pleased God. Why? Because it pleases God when one soul is saved. Heaven rejoices. Heaven rejoices. God gave His Son for you. That's the value of your soul to God. That's the value of your life to God. Don't allow God's gift to be wasted on you. Don't allow it to be wasted. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, don't throw away that gift. Receive the gift of eternal life. Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Don't throw away your life and your eternity. You will not find self-worth and value in the world or in others or in any other thing. It is in God alone that you find the value of your soul because He gave His Son for you. It's only to be found when you realize what He was willing to give and do for you. The value of a soul. What's a soul worth? Well, it's worth the greatest price that was ever paid. Indeed. One soul. It doesn't matter what they look like on the outside. Red, brown, yellow, black, white. None of that matters. Because God loves that soul. Because He made it. He made it to live with Him and be with Him. And God made you. And He's given you life. And, he, and He's given that life value. May the Lord help us not throw it all away by never seeing how much we mean to him. The value of the soul. May we make souls a priority. May we be persistent in it. May we realize that all of heaven
rejoice in when his soul is saved. We're going to stop there today. I hope you'll share this message. Encourage someone to, to watch it on one of our, our social media resources. Find someone who is going through a difficult time and tell them how much they mean to God, what God gave to them, and how valuable they are to the Lord. And uh, may we put that same value on souls, on souls. God is in the saving business. He'll save souls. And the gospel works. We just have to share it and get people under the sound of God's word. Well, may the Lord help us today, the value of a soul. We're going to pray together, and then we're going to stand, and we've got a song we're going to put up here, and we're going to sing a verse of that song. And we <coughs> encourage you to be obedient to the Lord. Maybe you're here in the service. You don't, you've never really trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Coming to church won't get you to heaven. And trying to do right won't get you to heaven. And trying to do things that you feel like are good for your family, your children, I'm going to get you to heaven. Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay your debt of sin so that you might believe in him. And that's what's going to get you to heaven. And that's something we all must do. And so, uh, so if you've never done that, today's the day. Settle it. Settle it right now. And uh, move forward in your relationship with the Lord. If you're here today and uh, you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, never forget the value that you have to him. Don't let other people or the world what they do or do not do, even the experiences of life, cannot set the value of your life. Only God can do that. And he set it high. He gave his only begotten son for you. And that's never going to change in God's heart. That's what you mean to him. And uh, he has a purpose. He has a value in your life that he wants you to discover. Uh, so may the Lord help us. Uh, don't forget, use a gospel track. Uh, be right with God so we can pray. Our Lord speak into your heart. Now is the time to respond to him. Heavenly Father, we just are getting ready, Lord, together to stand. And uh, Lord, we're going to give a time where we can respond to you as the lost, responding to a Savior who loves them and gave himself to them that they might be saved. Or Lord, as your people, God, may we follow you and we put our life in your hands be willing to, 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 to invest it all in what you came to seek and to save. That's lost souls. Lord, may we rejoice in what you rejoice in. Get excited about God, what excites heaven. God, may we not be turned easily aside. May we see, God, that we've got to be persistent. Stay at it. Put a value on one soul. God, may we get the lost under the sound of the gospel where they can be saved. God, it's never failed. I've seen it all through 30 years of ministry. If someone just gets under the sound of the gospel for just a little while, God, they'll trust you and be saved. Help us, Lord, to get people to church, get the gospel to people. Lord, we pray that, God, that you'll have your way in this moment of invitation. You do what, God, you want to do in our hearts and lives. May we all be obedient to you. We ask it in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.